Drumlog is a hybrid drum machine with four analog tracks, six sample-based tracks, and another digital synth track, which, with an open SDK, has the potential to expand Drumlog's sonic capabilities far beyond what you get in the box. It has relatively extensive I.O. if you want to process tracks with external effects or control it via MIDI and USB. And a relatively easy to use interface. In this video, I'll take an in-depth look at what makes it tick, including pros and cons compared to other drum machines and groove boxes, and then wrap up by playing you all 64 of its factory patterns. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Quark sent Drumlog over for review, but as always, they have no say over the content of this video. This channel is funded by viewers who subscribe to my content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and Ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's start with an overview. I'll say to Drumlog's credit that even though at first glance it may seem a bit complex, it's actually quite intuitive to figure out the vast majority of what it does just by poking around, not to mention watching this video, of course. It's got a total of 11 parts or voices or tracks, four analog drum synth tracks, and then six sample bass tracks, and one digital synth track called Multi, which currently has three engines, a VPM engine, which is FM based, a noise engine, and a user engine, which is open to third party developers and comes bundled with a built in dual oscillator virtual analog monosynth called Nano by the plugin developer SignVibes. In terms of hands on controls, you've got small level knobs for each of the 11 tracks. So you can control that individually and then a few dedicated parameter knobs for some of the tracks. Some of the knobs are shared as shift functions. So for example, the tune of uh, S the SP1 track and shift and tune to tune the second track. And then the knobs are a nice start, but they only represent a small part of the sound design parameters you have for each of the voices. You can access additional parameters once you select the track and then page up and page down into uh, several pages of additional parameters. For example, for the bass drum, you can choose the type of transient. So typically each of these will have a uh, couple of parameter pages dedicated to the individual instrument, and then a couple of other pages dedicated to mix and routing to effects. More on that later. The knobs, by the way, are pots, so very fast and good control. And these are encoders under the screen. They're click encoders. So it does take a few turns to go through their entire range. Aside from the 11 tracks, you've got two send effects, delay and reverb, and one master insert effect. Each of these effects also has a few models or types. And these are also open to the SDK. So potentially you could have totally different effects here developed by third parties. Currently delays are only delays, which makes sense. Reverbs are a whole bunch of reverbs and the master can be either EQ, boost, which is saturation, a filter, and a compressor, which also supports sidechain from one or more of the tracks. To complete the panel overview, you've got 16 buttons on the bottom. They're not velocity sensitive. So if you want velocity sensitivity, you'll have to connect an external keyboard or drum pad to this. These have quite a few modes. So for example, in live mode, they just play the different parts. Uh, you can use them to chain patterns, to create loops in a performance, edit patterns. You could also use them to select programs or kits. So for example, if I've got uh, this pattern going, I could select a different one by pressing select and then uh, choosing say this one and hitting select. But I could also select or shift select the cue patterns using the buttons. And they've got a few additional functions like muting different parts, selecting different parts. And if you can see here on the bottom, additional functions when you hold shift. So editing patterns, automation or motion and kits. 
In terms of sequencing, each of the 11 parts gets its own sequencer with up to 64 steps per part, and you can run the sequences at different speeds relative to each other. Each track or part can have its own length as well, again, between one to 64 steps. And this one was at three in my pattern here. Parts can also have a relative speed if you like, so they can be aligned with a global speed or have a rate that's a certain multiple and triplet multiple of the global rate. There's support for ratchets, accents, and multiple automation lanes. We'll get into this later. You can store up to 128 different programs, a program being a collection of patterns for each track, and 128 kits, which you can store together with the patterns or swap them out separately. Continuing with the overview, Drumlog seems very well built. There's no wiggle in the knobs or in the encoders. The screen is high-res, contrasty OLED viewable from any angle. It's quite small for sure, but you're mostly seeing and editing only four parameters at a time, so it's not unreasonable. One of the things that takes a bit of getting used to is the distance between these side encoders and the parameters that they control. So obviously a wider screen would have been better. The panel is brushed aluminum and is a bit of a fingerprint magnet. The sides are, I think, wood, but don't hold me to it. And the rest of the enclosure is plastic. Overall, Drumlog is quite light at three pounds or 1.4 kilos. In terms of connectivity, Drumlog has quite a few options for its size. You've got quarter inch headphone outputs and stereo left and right outputs. Then like I mentioned, for assignable outputs, you can assign any one of the 11 tracks to these four outputs. Then there's a 3.5 millimeter audio input, analog sync in and out, MIDI in and out. Then finally there's USB, both type A and type B. The type A will connect and power, I guess within reason, MIDI controllers and USB type B will hook up to a computer, both send and receive MIDI, and you can use the USB type B slot when Drumlog is in storage mode to pass samples onto the internal storage, and when such third-party plugins become available, either add multi-plugins or effect plugins to it. Managing programs, kits, samples, synths, and effects plugins on Drumlog doesn't require a librarian. All of its contents are just available when you connect it in storage mode. So that's it as far as the overview goes. Let's dive in a little bit deeper and start with the six digital sample-based tracks. Drumlog has six voices or parts capable of playing back samples. Note that Drumlog isn't a sampler, even though it does have an audio input if you want to mix in external audio or process it with the effects. So you'll need to load up samples using the USB port in the back. There's no official word in the documentation as to how much storage is available for samples, but when you plug it into the computer to transfer files, it says there's 32 megabytes free on the drive. So I assume that's the upper limit for samples, projects, kits, and user synths and effects. Sample playback is, at least currently, limited to an attack decay envelope, each of which can be, I think, around two seconds long. So the longest possible attack and decay envelope is about four seconds. That said, I tried, and you can load up samples that are longer than four seconds. So I actually loaded up a sample. If I go into the uh, user samples, these, by the way, are a few Percons samples from my sample pack, but let's move on to this. This is a stereo sample that's about a minute long. So if I go ahead to edit its parameters, I can move the start point forward. But regardless of where I set the end point, you're limited to, uh, this is as long as the decay goes, and we can make the sample a bit longer by adding a tag. So that's the segment that you get, and I can move this segment backwards and forwards through the sample. And yes, you can automate this, so if I go to uh, this preset, so if I hit play here, I'm basically moving through different start points in the sample at uh, a very slow tempo. You do get clicks when a sample cuts off the previous one, hopefully this is a beta issue. Anyhow, obviously a big wish list feature here is to uh, have an attack hold release style envelope with the option to set a hold time. Drumlog can play both mono and stereo samples. Just bear in mind that stereo samples take up double the space. So for example, this minute long sample took up about 20 megabytes of the 32 available megabytes. Another reason not to load stereo samples is that uh, every part, both analog and digital, has panning controls and a uh, spread control. 
Now let's move on. The tracks aren't limited to their on-panel namesakes. I think they're all identical except maybe the um, Rimshot track, which only has a uh, decay parameter and no attack. The others have attack uh, in the uh, menu pages here and decay on the panel. Anyway, you're not limited to say having closed hats here. You just go into the uh, sample selection and there are a few banks of samples. So these are 16 hats and then there's a bank of open hats, from shots, claps, and then a whole bunch of miscellaneouses. So there are 64 of these and 16 of each of these. So that's 128 factory samples. And then you've got uh, up to 128 user samples in the user bank. And then there's another uh, exp expansion bank, which also can hold up to 128 user samples. Aside from the on-panel controls for the samples, you've got um, tuning and you can actually both sequence and play these chromatically. We talked about start and end, and then you've got a filter for um, for each of these, both low pass to high pass with resonance, and then a bit crusher and drive. So those are the sound design controls for samples. Let's move on and talk about the analog parts. The kick gets these three onboard controls and then a few more uh, on-screen controls, a sample-based transient. Let's maybe change this a bit. So a few transient options here. And then you've got a uh, control over the um, pitch sweep. And time, hold time. And the level of the attack, that's the um, sample based transient that's layered on top of the analog kick. Then there's the snare, snappy control, tune, decay, and again, additional parameters available on, uh, on these pages. Same deal here, snappy type, and tone changes the tuning deviation of the two drum heads. Level of the snap, and a cutoff with resonance. Moving on to the low and high toms, their parameters are identical, except that they have a uh, different tuning range. So again, three on panel parameters, and let's see what we've got here. A layer, so again, a digital layer. on top of the analog tom, level of that layer, sweep controls, and a filter with resonance, and this drive here. One thing you should be aware of and careful, um, if you want to change the uh, shift parameters, you obviously need to hold shift, but don't press this uh, when you're holding shift because that will clear the part. So, unless you want to, of course. So you can sort of, uh, if you want to edit the high toms, for example, here, hit shift, tune it, and edit it like that, or just get a pattern going. So those are the analog parts and voices. Let's move on to the digital synth engine called the multi-engine. Even though it occupies these three slots on the bottom here, it's only one voice or one part you choose the different options using part and holding in. So there's VPM, noise, and user, which you need to choose nano as the only option currently. 
The SDK for the multi-engine for Drumlog, by the way, is different from other synths in the line, like the NTS-1, Minilog XD, or the Prolog, so other plugins won't immediately work as is, but I'm told it's a similar environment, so it shouldn't be as hard as writing them from scratch. Let's take a look and listen to these. I'll start with the VPM engine. VPM is a two oscillator FM or phase modulation style synth where one sine wave oscillator modulates the phase of another. It's got a page of presets if you don't want to bother with its individual parameters. So there are a few of these. But uh, this is where it gets really interesting. There are a few uh, envelope options. Let's set this to ASR so it'll hold. You can choose the note that it'll play and you can automate it this way or just use an external keyboard to play it. The screen, by the way, will quickly dim uh, and remove the parameters. So just touch them and they come back. Anyway, so it has a few interesting options. Let's move index all the way down. It starts with a sine wave. Let's pitch it up. And then index is the mod depth for the second oscillator. And the ratio is the ratio between the modulator and the carrier. Basically, the higher the harmonics get as you uh, move the index up and down. And then noise is feedback on the second operator. So if you're, the index is zero, you won't hear noise but uh, you will as you start to increase the index. Now you can hear this is a bit clicky, so hopefully they'll solve this issue so you can perform with this encoder, but you can also assign the envelope to modulate the index. And then it's a smooth modulation. So that is the VPM engine. Nice FM sounds. Let's move on to the noise engine. Simple digital noise. There are a few algorithms here. And uh, controls as you'd expect for resonance and a filter. And then attack and release. And that's pretty much it in terms of noise parameters. And then moving to the third option, the user engine. Like I mentioned, this can be anything you load onto it when developers start making stuff for it. But uh, the uh, bundled option is Nano by Sine Vibes. Nano is a two oscillator virtual analog synth. You've got uh, multiple waveforms to choose from and you can detune them from each other. You choose the balance between them. This works for all the shapes. And the note. Then the second page is a filter. You've got a few filter options, low pass, high pass, and band pass. with uh, resonance. So it sounds really nice. Let's maybe go into the effects and add a bit of reverb here. Anyway, so this, and you can play this externally as well. key tracking, which is important if you play melodies and want the filter to open up as you play higher notes. And then unlike all the other engines, there are actually four pages of parameters here. So page three is the envelope generator 
and page four is an LFO. Let's maybe start with the LFO. So you choose a depth and you can point it to pitch or the uh, filter. Let's maybe cut the resonance a bit and um, lower the frequency, choose a different shape. Okay, so that's the LFO, and there are a few LFO shapes. Trapezoid peak, sample and hold, which is random, and a smooth random. So that's the LFO. And that goes to pitch as well if you want vibrato. And then an envelope generator. Again, sent to either pitch or the cutoff with multiple envelope types. Let's take the decay. So, nice. So that's Nano, and for those interested, yes, it can get quite acidic. Okay, let's move on and talk about sequencing. Patterns can be up to 64 steps across four pages. So you can say expand a pattern very easily to 64 steps this way. And then you move between the pages that you want to edit with these arrow keys. You can also choose the pattern length by holding time and shrinking it down to as many steps as you like. And like I mentioned earlier, you can also do this on a per part basis. So each part can have a different length. You can either step sequence or record live into a pattern. Let's just uh, choose an empty one. You can record with or without a metronome and you can set recording to wait for you or just overdub. So say, recorded that and so that's re recording live. You can save patterns and kits separately and uh, you can rename a pattern if you like. Let's just leave this as knit program. You can also record melodies live if you like. So let's say. Aside from recording steps into a pattern live using the pads or uh, an external keyboard, you can also record automation or the motion of parameters. And I'm gonna, for a second, go ahead into the global parameters and uh, turn off the metronome. We don't need that anymore. Let's say that I wanted to automate the index in this pattern, just hit motion and start turning the knob. Oh, of course hit record. So hit record. You can see the steps being recorded. And there's no smoothing here. I think it would be nice if they had that. And let's say I wanted to also have noise change throughout the pattern, just hit record. And once I start turning the knob, it'll start recording. And it'll do that for the length of the pattern. Now I didn't get official word from Korg as far as how many parameters you can automate, but I counted it and it's, I think, eight. So if I uh, keep automating parameters, let's mess with the ratio. This might be a mess. And uh, try and go into here. Index mod, and let's go nuts, and edit this, and uh, attack, and the reverb send. So we can keep doing this until it tells us to stop. Okay, motion full. Now that's on a per part basis, I think, so quite a bit. I can uh, save this masterpiece if I want. And if it's too much, just hold shift and clear the uh, part automation or all the automation. Okay, so that's our pattern. 
without any automation. Let's look at step sequencing. So up until now we were recording live, but we could do all of this manually, of course. So where would we be without a row of hi-hats? Just hit step, accent, or motion to start step sequencing. Hit step and fill this up and we get hi-hats. Now I could try and bring a bit of life to these by say automating decay and create interest that way, but there's a groove option. If I go into shift and groove, here we go, and hold this, and I can choose, of course, swing and to impact velocity, but there are quite a few options here. Cool. Let's keep that. So interesting groove options. Now, what I did here was actually set the groove for the entire pattern not the part if I wanted to set groove just for the hi-hats. So let's say conga three and maybe nothing for all the rest. So let's get this back to zero globally. There's no way to reset quickly. Okay, so now we're, we lack groove totally globally. Okay, but then I hit shift groove and then hit part. And now I'm setting the hats groove. So I don't want that to be global. Okay, good. So now we've set the part groove as opposed to the global groove. So step lets you add and remove steps. If you hold a step, then you'll have a few other options. There's probability and uh, a way to alternate, if I say this step every uh, two loops or once every three loops. And you can edit multiple steps at a time this way, by the way. So these steps will only happen once every three loops, and then you can add probability on top of that. There's micro timing if you want. And uh, that is it for the step pattern edits. Then there's the accent sequencer. So let's accent, say a few of these steps. And if you hold the step here, you get access to a few other options. So side accent, you've got ratchet. So let's maybe ratchet this step. Okay, you can have the ratchets fall. And we're not hearing it because I forgot the probabilities on. So let's edit that back to 100% and no alternates. So we always get this step. Okay, back to here, hold this. It's rising. This goes up to four. Let's keep it flat. Cool. So ratchets. Now there's one more hidden option here that doesn't appear on any of the tracks, any of the parts, but the multi-part. So if we enter the multi-part and go back into the step mode, you'll notice that we can sequence ties here or note lengths. That's only relevant for the multi-engine because that's the only one with an attack sustain release envelope. Hopefully we also get attack sustain uh, release envelopes for the different sample based parts, but we don't have that currently. Then the last thing we can step sequence if we want is the automation. Let's say, for example, go into um, our VPM part. So you can't see which lanes are automated. Unfortunately, you have to uh, just press a um, step and then wiggle its button. And you can see the automation here. And this is the automation, say, for the VPM index. So you can insert different automations here on a per step basis. And then I can automate a different parameter, say the uh, ratio here, and this will probably be a mess. Okay, I can live with this. This is, by the way, how you also automate pitch. So if I hold this here, you'll notice that um, we can, uh, here we go, note. There's a note name here. Okay, so that's note automation. And for lovers of randomness, or glitch. Uh, you can also motion sequence the sample. So let's lower the VPM engine for a bit and go into, say, the uh, closed hat part. Okay, so that's our hi hats. And then uh, let's change.
change things up a bit. We've got the steps triggering here. Let's say in this one, uh, change this hat. And this one change to this hat. This one change to this hat. And this one, why don't we swap the bank to the open hats or why not go to my user bank? Yeah, and choose a percon sample, for example. It seems to work for the first sample. Frankly, I don't know if you're supposed to be able to do this across multiple banks because sample flipping isn't a documented feature, but it at least partially works in this beta, so hopefully this feature carries on to the production version. Okay, so that's pretty much what you need to know about sequencing. There's, um, you know, these shift functions, I won't go through all of them. Let's say if you've got too much automation, you can clear a part automation or just all the automation. And you can clear a part pattern or the entire pattern. And then hitting this again is an undo. There's no overall undo, but there is uh, when you clear these patterns. We already talked about groove per pattern or per part earlier. I mentioned timing as well. Let's maybe show you a... Uh, pattern I created with a few polymeter options. So let's go for this. So here, for example, you can see we've got different length tracks. This is three steps long, and uh, this one I think is nine or seven. So this is a nice way to make patterns that don't sound as repetitive. And there's a nice factory preset that shows this off as well. And if I didn't mention it, you can see all 11 patterns, 16 steps per bar on screen at once. Okay, moving on, and let's go back to our knit program, not the init program. Let's talk a bit about effects. Drumlog has two send effect slots, a delay and reverb, which like I mentioned in the future, probably will be able to load up user effects into, and then a master effect slot, which is an insert effect. So these two are sends and these are inserts. So let's say for example, that I wanted to add a reverb to the hats and in live mode, if I don't want it to play, you can hold the part button and press the part to select it silently. And then if I page up to the mix slash routing section, I can add reverb and also add a, uh, I send if I want. And uh, if I wanted to edit the delay or reverb effects, just press either one, and they've got a few pages of um, parameters. So for the delay, either tempo sync or not. And then uh, timing options. options, ping pong, saturation, filtering, I'll filter type here we go. So if I want high pass or low pass, this is for the delays, right? Then reverb has its uh, parameters. algorithms. Space, riser, submarine. So that's what we've got in terms of uh, send effects. And then there's a um, lots of this room, a master effect. So simple EQ, saturation, Master filter, resonance, cutoff. And a uh, brilliant compressor. We've got threshold, attack release, and a ratio. And uh, makeup gain. Are ridiculously long. Let's make them a bit shorter. And a faster release. So that 
stream. So that's the compressor. And it also has sidechain. So the way this works is this. You first turn sidechain on, in which case the audio will be compressed based on whatever audio you're sending into the sidechain. And you can determine that on a track by track basis if we go to the effects screen and go into here, into a sidechain level. So in this case, for the bass drum, I'm gonna want to send it to the compressor to sidechain. Okay. You can hear it duck the entire audio, but that's no good to us if it ducks the kick, which is why we can turn off sending the bass drum to the master, which is the uh, compressor, okay? So now we get the kick, and we can adjust the uh, compressor settings to taste. still hear the kick through the mix. If we change the kick's parameters, we'll hear this maybe uh, a bit more eloquently. Here we go. So we go back into here, and let's maybe even give it uh, more of a transient. Okay, so it's cutting through the mix, as opposed to, uh, yeah, just sending it to the master, which doesn't do us any good. So once we've got our masterpiece programmed, let's take a look at a few performance functions we've got. There's loop, which will um, loop a step. And you can have it synced or not. So the pattern will resume if it's synced and we'll get totally messed up. If you don't, there's a sync speed. And you can hold multiple nodes. So let's say, play them in different directions. And just keep this pressed if you like. So loop's a fun one. And I think select is also an interesting performance function. So let's assume this is our, um, our pattern and I've got it saved here as knit pattern, of course, then let's save it here as well into uh, pattern 10 and make a few changes to it. Um, let's say go into uh, the snares, for example, and just go to town here with the snares. Okay, and save this in this line. So now when I hit select, I can move back and forth between these patterns and say, use this as a fill. Which I think is a really cool uh, performance function, just the immediate select. By the way, if you want, you can cue a selection. So if you hit shift and select, then the patterns won't change until either the end of the bar or the end of the pattern based on the setting in the global settings. So that's the select as a performance function. Of course, there's mutes. And then I don't know if this qualifies as a performance function, but there's the um, randomization options, uh, say for the pattern here, for the part. So let's go to my poor snares again. Oops. And hit uh, randomize part. This randomizes the steps. You can also randomize the kit. So a nice way to come up with ideas there. And as long as you don't resave the pattern, you can always uh, just reload it while it's playing. And then I think, uh, yes, chains, we didn't cover that. If uh, 64 steps aren't enough for you, just hit chain, then you can chain up to 64 patterns. So say I could go into this one and choose, of course, my knit program for this one, and also choose the knit program for this one, but we want the second version of that for this one. So now we've got a chain of three patterns. Pretty easy. Cool. Moving on to external audio and using external effects. Drumlog does not send the audio of its parts separately over USB, but you can route 
four parts out individually through the four audio outputs. This is a great way to process tracks separately or to integrate effects into the signal path by routing audio back through the audio input. So this is the before external processing version of our pattern, in particularly the multi-engine. And then if I go into global settings and mute the uh, multi-engine, so if I hit play now, we won't hear it. And then go into this setting, you'll notice I've assigned multi to output number four, and I'm setting the audio from output four to Rattler and then the audio back in through the audio input. The audio input, by the way, is in stereo. Here I've got the mono jack sort of halfway in so that we hear it on both channels. Unfortunately, there's no panning for uh, the audio input, at least not in this firmware. Anyway, if I now go in to edit the audio input with shift and pressing here, I can now choose to route the external audio to any one of a number of destinations. Let's go for the master. You can already hear the hum of Rattler Anyway, if I hit play now, then we are uh, basically getting the audio from Rattler back in through the audio input. So that's how you can both send individual parts out to external effects and receive them back in the audio input. Just be careful to avoid digital clipping on the return. Now, unfortunately, you don't have individual sends for these. If I were to uh, hit play now and say route this audio to the reverb, then we're only hearing the full 100% mix of the reverb. We can't hear the uh, dry signal. Now I could go back into the settings and turn on or unmute this, but then this is nano not processed through Rattler. So currently it's an either or proposition. Changing the multi-level doesn't change the level of the audio going out the output. Anyway, it would be nice to be able to hear the external audio coming in dry and send it in parallel to the effects. Okay, before we head out to the pros and cons, let's take a look at a few miscellaneous and interesting settings. You can set choke groups by hitting shift and choke. So say if you wanted the hats to participate in a choke group. And then shift and poly isn't polyphony, but rather it enables total uh, polymetric freedom, so each part can have its own length and they won't reset based on the length of the longest part. And if you don't want to hold shift while editing the parameters of a voice that requires it, just long press shift and you get a shift hold. And then you can say edit the parameters of SP2 and not SP1. Just be careful not to leave this on and press any of these buttons because you might erase your kit or pattern and so on. Then shift and global gets us to the global settings and you can either page through these or just hit these buttons as shortcuts quickly to settings that uh, you know where they're at. I won't go over all of these, but um, you can save the kits with the patterns or not if you want, so turn that on or off. Uh, you can turn on or off quantization if you don't want to record locked into the grid. What else that's interesting? You can set the metronome to go out just to the headphones if you like. Then you've got settings for which parts you want to go out the four outputs and whether you want to mute them or not. And uh, finally, you can set how you want MIDI to operate. So you can have a different note trigger different parts, in which case you'd want to do that and choose the channel. Or if you want different MIDI channels to trigger different parts, you can choose the ranges in which you want that to happen. By the way, if you do use a USB controller, I noticed that it doesn't work. If you plug in the controller while drum log is on, you need to turn it off plug the controller in the back and then turn it on. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons for Drumlog. First, to frame the discussion, even though you can program monophonic melodies into Drumlog and VPM and Nano are great simple monosynths, I wouldn't call Drumlog a full groove box. This is first and foremost designed to be a drum machine, which you may want to pair with a polyphonic synth unless someone develops a polyphonic uh, user engine, though even then you couldn't sequence it directly through here unless they allow you to program chords. I'm just spitballing ideas here if someone wants to develop it. Anyway, it's a drum machine. Now, as such, it has both drum synths, analog and digital, and it can play back samples, which is quite a rare combination. There are quite a few other drum machines that only have drum synths like Syntact or can only play samples. So it's beyond the scope of this video to compare those here. I'll just say that if you're interested in a drum machine and you're fine with it only playing samples, not to mention sampling, which this can't do, there are better options. But if you're interested in combining samples with synthesis, whether it's the analog drum synth tracks 
or the multi-engine. The only alternative that comes to mind with a similar level of pricing and controls is the TR-8S from Roland. It has both a broad range of drum synths and can play Mac samples, so it's probably the closest competitor, as is the less expensive but less hands-on TR-6S. I've reviewed both in depth on the channel if you want more information, but in short, they both have way more synth engine models and more flexible sample playback capabilities, and in the case of the 8S, probably more hands-on controls, but neither have analog drum synths if that's important to you, and neither have an open programmable plug-in engine, which based on past history means you can expect the unexpected. If the same army of developers that have been developing plugins for the NTS-1 and Minilog XD offer plugins for this, expect many pleasant surprises, basically either free or at low cost. Now, if you have a bigger budget, the MPC-1 and Analog Rhythm and Machine Plus are worth a look, all more expensive and capable, but more complex with many more pros. No one offers the open plugin platform that this does, which is an ace in Korg's sleeve here. And again, there's something to be said for a drum machine that just wants to be a drum machine and is optimized for that kind of interaction. Now we can't have just pros. On the cons side, I like to split these to hardware and software issues. On the hardware side, first, the shift functions are really hard to see on the panel, especially in the dark or if lights coming from a wrong angle. And then there's the issue I mentioned earlier, sample playback length is limited to an attack decay style envelope and less than four seconds. Hopefully that's something they can add to or change in a firmware update, though it can be said that you don't need long samples on a drum machine. Still, I think it would be nice to have that here. Also, this isn't a sampler, which is a shame since it has an audio input. Who knows, maybe that's something they can add in a firmware update, but until then, this can't sample, it's only a sample player. Further on the hardware side, I mentioned this earlier, it would have been nice if the screen was as wide as the knobs, so the knobs would be directly under what you're controlling. And then finally on the hardware side, especially if they grant my wish for an attack hold release or an attack sustain release envelope, 32 megabytes is relatively small compared to some of the competition. So those are the major things I think you should know about on the hardware side. On the firmware side, other than fixing the bugs, which I'm assuming they'll do because this is a pre-production version, I've got a few items on my wish list. Probably the biggest one is I'd like to be able to reassign these knobs. So it's nice that we have all these hands-on controls, but I think they're relevant, many of them, for when you set up a pattern as opposed to when you perform with it. So maybe the tuning of the bass drum, you know, that's something that, um, that uh, yes, you, uh, you know, may set once, but afterwards you actually may not want it to get uh, out of tune. This, say, as opposed to the VPM engine or the uh, user engine, which really get no performance knobs, you can use the encoders, but like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard to sweep the entire length here, plus you need to page up and down between the different pages of the engine. Anyway, it would be nice to be able to reassign these knobs and maybe reassign the encoder knobs so that if people do give us nice and comprehensive engines like say Nano with four different pages of parameters, then you've got the two pages of uh, mixing and routing on top of that, that we can maybe have macros here and reassign parameters to the stuff that matters to us when we want to perform with a pattern as opposed to just these preset parameters. Now, if Korg don't grant my wish, many of the parameters here are MIDI mappable. So a small companion MIDI controller with a few knobs can take care of that. Most of the parameters, by the way, are indeed accessible via MIDI, but some, for some reason, aren't. For example, I think like the, uh, the cutoff frequency here Hopefully it shouldn't be hard to expose these in MIDI as well. And then one more wishlist feature. I think it would be nice if they would let us use these pads to play notes chromatically or in a scale. So you could get two octaves in a scale from these pads. Right now you either need an external MIDI controller to program in notes or sequence notes step by step by holding a note and setting its pitch. Sequence notes this way. Since all six sample tracks and, of course, the multi-engine can be played melodically, I think that playing these pads would be a nice shortcut as opposed to going step by step and sequencing using a menu. So that's it for Drumlog. Stay tuned for a quick run through of the factory patterns. If you liked the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful. Ring the YouTube bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.